memory. So this involves the retention of information over time. There's two kinds. The book talks about implicit and explicit memory. Implicit is without a conscious recollection. Recollection. It's just something that you know. For example, riding a bike. You don't remember learning how to ride a bike, and you don't remember that exact time, but you do have an implicit memory, so you do know how to ride a bike. Once you've learned it, you just kind of always know it. An explicit memory is a conscious remembering of facts and experiences. If you tell a short story, like your first memory, that's an explicit memory. Riding a bike, using a spoon, things of that nature are going to be implicit memories. Related to this is childhood amnesia. So most adults can remember little, if anything, from the first three years of life. Memories at three are almost completely gone by the time you're nine years old. What this might be is related to the prefrontal lobe. So part of the memory storage occurs here and that part of the brain is not fully developed. And so you can't, um, you can't go back. Once the brain does develop, you don't, can't go back to uh, remember those things. When you are two and three though, you do can kind of have memories for that time. Um, I might make a separate video on that. So when Leif was a baby, his first birthday, he accidentally touched one of the candles from his birthday cake, it made him cry, it made him very upset. For his second birthday, when we lit the candles, he immediately started crying. And it's probably because he remembered what happened at the, at least potentially remembered what happened at that first birthday. It was that implicit, explicit, not sure, but he definitely doesn't like fire now. On to language. So these go in order. You cry first, then you coo, then you babble. Um, I have... Crying, obviously, you're going to know what that is. Babbling, like da, 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 ba, 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 la, la, la. Cooing, if you don't know what that is. Here's an example. So it's kind of like a joyful outburst, to be one way of putting it. So, yes, crying, then the cooing and then the babbling. Then they start getting into showing and pointing at things. For recognizing language sounds, these are called, so phonemes are the basic sound units of language. And the book says that we are, when we're born, we are citizens of the world. Infants can distinguish sound changes no matter what language the syllables come from when they're infants. The way they do this research is they go, they'll like headphones on them and go ba 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 and the kid will listen to it and they'll turn towards it and then they'll kind of fade out because it's not a novel and then they'll change it to la 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 and when they change that phoneme the kid will turn their head again so they can pick up on that and they can pick up on changes in phonemes for all languages then at about six months old they can only recognize phonemes from their own language and then it becomes more difficult Probably one of the reasons why it's best to learn language when you're a kid. For example, Leif and Virginie are uh, French citizens, French American citizens, and they speak French. And there are some things that they say that I just can't. It's, it sometimes I'm beginning to pick up the difference on some of these phonemes, and sometimes I can't. Like doo-doo and dodo are two different things. You, I'm I'm exaggerating it a little bit to make it make sense to me, but doo-doo is like his little um, doll that he has. And Dodo is to go to sleep. Um, he has the doo-doo for Dodo. So anyways, but I'm making the I'm making it a little bit more exaggerated. Sometimes I can't hardly hear the difference in those phonemes. And it's because I just wasn't exposed to those different um, sounds when I was a kid. On first words, so 10 to 15 months, on average, 13 months old is when you let's say their first word. Their receptive vocabulary is a lot bigger than their spoken vocabulary, meaning that they understand a lot more words than they will actually say. So at 13 months old, they have a receptive vocabulary of about 50 words. So they understand 50 words, even though they may just say, you know, a couple of them. By 18 months, they will say about 50 words. And then they will have what's called a vocabulary spurt. Figure 3.23, so here's the first words, and then a vocabulary spurt between, you know, uh, 13, 14 months up to about two years. So I'll have this huge increase. And life has been like that at about, you know, somewhere in here. He just started basically repeating everything that I would say to him. Related to this on language ac acquisition, we've talked about this before, it is both biology 
and the experience that contributes to language development. Again, nature and nurture. They can hear all of those phonemes at birth, that's the nature, but then they actually learn the words in their environment, that is the nurture. They used to think that learning language was just behaviorism, the idea of rewards and punishments, and you say the right word and you get rewarded, but that doesn't really hold up. One, it's an interaction. Two, we talked a little bit about the social cognitive theories and the idea of modeling. A lot of it, in my experience, has been modeling. Like Leif, he'll say things that I do. Like Sometimes I'll kind of grunt when I'm getting up uh, like this. When he was like, I don't know, 18 months, he started doing that too. He'd get up, uh, he'd pick something up. Uh. It's like there wasn't any reward or punishment for that. He was just modeling what he saw in his environment. There are some biological influences on language, that being said. So there are some parts of the brain, Broca's area and Wernicke's area. So Broca's area, it's part of the brain in the left frontal lobe that is involved in speech production, the ability to produce speech. And then Wernicke's area, it's the left hemisphere, it's involved in language comprehension. You can have a stroke and it can affect one area but not the other one. So you may not be able to produce speech, but you can understand it. You may be able to understand it, but you might not be able to speak it. And that's because this uh, stroke maybe just hits one of those areas, Broca or Wernicke's. Uh, related to this is the language acquisition device. This is an idea that Noam Chomsky came up with. Uh, it describes a biological endowment enabling the child to detect the features and rules of a language. So we're talking about phonology, uh, syntax, semantics, that you're basically born with an ability to um, produce language. That being said, this relates back to, I think, chapter one, we talked a little bit about it, the idea of a critical period. There's probably a critical period for learning language. And the reason that they know this, or suspect it anyways, is that every once in a while they will find a kid that's just been lost out in the woods or... Um, for example, Jeannie, she was um, basically caged in the basement of a house. Hopefully you've heard this story before. Um, and I think they let her out when I don't remember. She was like eight or nine, something like that. And she never, she did learn how to speak some, but she never learned how to speak the way that we do. Um, because she just, did, she missed that critical period for learning language because she was tied up down in the basement. There are environmental influences on language obviously so early speech input in poverty has an effects on a kids language skills so again if you're exposed to a lot of different like novel stimulus novel language that's something that's going to help if you're not um, if you're not having a lot of interactions if this the kid that we're talking about hypothetically isn't getting spoken to a lot um, it's going to have negative effects on their language abilities um, vocabulary development, it's also um, linked to a family's SES and the type of talk that a kid has to their parents. It, kind of related to this, some research has shown that parents from lower SES backgrounds speak to their kids less often. And there's probably several reasons for this, but one that I can think of right offhand. If you're in a lower SES background, you're probably working more hours, maybe you're having to work two jobs. And so when you get home at night, you don't want to spend a lot of time talking and so you just kind of sit there and you're just trying to chill out and so maybe you don't talk to your kid that much in your mind you're not thinking oh i am neglecting them in some way by not speaking a lot to them but it is causing um a developmental effect again all this stuff kind of relates back to ses tv's not a suitable replacement so you actually have to interact with your kid you have to speak to them you can't just sit them in front of a tv and hope they'll learn language and then um Child-directed speech, talked a little bit earlier about this, the idea that you speak in a higher pitch than normal because kids can pick up that register better in using simple words and sentences. There are some develop or strategies that you can use to help kids learn language. Three things they talked about, recasting, expanding, and labeling. With recasting, you're essentially elaborating on what they said. So if they said, the dog's barking, doggy barking, um, you could ask a question like, when was the dog barking? And so you're having a conversation with them. Part of the language development is really just teaching them how to converse with another person. So yeah, elaborating, expanding. So if they say doggy eats, you could say, yes, the doggy is eating. So if they only say part of the, the sentence, doggy eat, you fill it in the rest of them. And then eventually they'll model that. Yes, the doggy is eating. 
And then the last one, labeling. What is this? What is that? What is this? Uh, something we do all the time. So like you get picture books. It's like pictures of zoo animals. What is this? What is that? Um, with life, he uh, would be like, that's a lion. You know, the lion. And then he'll, he makes sounds for a lot of them to go, roar. Or like with the elephant, he'll go, elephant. Roar. And he's kind of like bring this the trunk up. And so, yeah. Cute, fun games you can have that um, if you do have kids, those are things that you'll uh, enjoy doing. Chapter 3 is kind of a long chapter. That is all for that. When we get into Chapter 4, we'll talk more about infancy and we'll talk about social and emotional development. Thank you very much for listening to this Chapter 3 lecture.